Good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. For those of you on the phone as well, good morning. Thank you for being here. Um, welcome to Sydney Laredo's Blue Ribbon Committee for People with Disabilities meeting for September 15, 2021. And let's start the meeting by first calling it to order and reviewing and approving the minutes of August 18th. You should have the minutes immediately to your right. Any changes, revisions, or corrections that any of the members see that we have to make for two minutes? If not, then can I ask for some make a motion to approve the minutes? Was the attendance correct? I'll motion to approve. 
So the attempt's correct? Uh, it's correct now. Okay, but, but the only ones I had out was for last, for the 18th is Roberto Delgado. I'm not sure if he's, he's still, uh, he's, he's so we don't put him on anymore? Okay, and then um, <coughs> Dr. Ruthinger was absent, and Rebecca Morales was absent. For last time. So Rebecca and Dr. Ruthinger were not on the phone either? Yes, no. I was. Uh, Dr. Rippon was on the phone for the last week. She was not. No, because she was out for a doctor's appointment. Yeah, we were unable to connect Dr. Ruthinger last week. Oh, that's right. That's right. You're right. Okay. Okay, yeah. Just wanted to make sure. Okay. <coughs> we made those corrections on the roster. Okay, thank you. As you all know that the absences are becoming more vital than they are continuing because there's a city ordinance that requires it. Or rather, this allows us to continue with your membership if you're beyond four absences in a <coughs> year. So that's become quite important. Um, okay. So we've approved the minutes for August 18th. Any the next item is public comments. Is there any anyone who signed up to speak? On no, no, public comments. Okay. Um, let's go to the next item. My glasses are hanging up with this mask. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> um, discussion and possible action on the next steps. Um, report from Christine Reyes, Special Needs Program. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good. <laughs> Excited. Um, I have, uh, of course, some updates from our program, and then I have a presentation. I promise I will not take up too much time, but if you do have questions, I'm happy to answer. Um, our program has developed eight new cooking recipes for this month shared for social media. Um, of course, from our cooking recipes that we produce, we harvest from our own therapeutic garden here at the health department. Um, our goal, again, with the cooking recipes is to help educate families on the benefits of the therapeutic garden, as well as um, implement the skills at home, for instance, independent living skills, motor skills, social skills, and communication. We are venturing into providing the community with hydroponic herbs and vegetable educational videos. The reason why we're also going to this form of gardening is so that we can help clients that, are ha that have a medical home setting and cannot be outside. September 14th, yesterday, was the start of the Texas Council for Developmental Disabilities Orientation. The meeting was done virtually. Uh, this allowed myself to get to know other representatives throughout the state of Texas and also got, uh, we were given more information on the upcoming meetings and trainings that we'll be doing in Austin. Um, I want and I have high hopes to share with the committee news and updates and also hopefully take back information. I want to be able to utilize this opportunity to have voices, ideas, concerns heard to make a difference uh, if we can in Austin. September is prepared this month. Our program has already been offering educational resources via social media. On a weekly basis, we provided com the community and the community support groups with weekly theme ready.gov information for emergency preparedness. Uh, within September, uh, it being prepare, preparing this month, we decided to also um, submit a proposal for an event. Um, it was approved, but we're still uh, ironing out the details. The idea of the preparedness month event, uh, it's a hosted uh, drive through event uh, that will be a collaborative effort between fire department and epidemiology. Our goal is to uh, register 250 families and uh, provide them with a webinar for emergency preparedness. The webinar will be educational and resourceful for families in case of an emergency, and will also give us an opportunity to do questionnaires and surveys. During the drive through event, we'll be offering emergency preparedness resource bags that include FEMA resources, sensory and tactile material, educational safety material for families, such as family emergency plans. We also have a collaborative event upcoming in October 13th with Texas Workforce Commission 
Inclusion Works that focuses on National Disability, Disability Employment Awareness Month. This is gonna be a virtual event. I believe when there's more details, we'll share them via email uh, with our partners soon. That's with Ms. Sanchez and sure, of Ms. Course. <laughs> So I'm really excited about that one. I know uh, October is going to be a busy month and it's going to be great. I, I believe I, even though we've uh, adapted virtually, I think it's going to be, we're going to be able to adjust a lot better than we did the first prior year and get more, more um, participants. We closed out the fiscal year 21 for our grant program. Our fourth quarter reports that uh, the target of client, target number of clients uh, we were supposed to obtain were 85 we were able to assist 391 this year. Um, that's a 460% increase of the intended uh, uh, requirement. The state has already voiced and emailed us that we're happy, they're happy and they're hopefully and they're looking forward to uh, bigger events and bigger outreaches for this next fiscal year. The presentation is on a project we've been working on for several months. Uh, the, pres uh, the presentation is focusing on a multi-sensory room. I was sorry, guys. Just in time. You're just in time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I believe in the beginning of the year, uh, Ms. Rodriguez and I had a one-on-one -on -one meeting and it was a big inspiration and ideas started flowing and, and all these ideas started happening and this is where the multi-sensory room idea started to develop. It was a planted seed. <laughs> and um, I'm happy to say it was an approved project. Uh, the area that they're focusing on this multi-sensory room uh, is currently at Faskin Community Center. Um, it will be uh, in collaboration with the Parks and Recreation Department. Um, so I'm going to give a little bit more information on why multi-sensory room and the benefits and just a little bit of education behind it and our hopeful for our goals. And again, um, some of uh, what we'll talk about is, of course, the members, the barriers and the greatest challenges that we face with our population, the opportunities it gives individuals with disabilities, um, and of course, the education behind a multi-sensory room. Now, uh, the National Recreation and Parks Association um, created an inclusion report that was most recent. It reported that 62% of individuals with cognitive disabilities and 74% of individuals with physical disabilities have been offered programming activities through the United States. But here with our own program, with our own surveys, with the state, 55% of caregivers report being isolated because their child's disability and over a third do not feel a sense of belonging in the community. So some of the numbers that we have here focus on members that are not only individuals with the special health care needs, but caregivers, the siblings, and the support systems. Um, mo majority of the reports that were done by the state were done through surveys through families that we have in our program and other programs that the state fosters. Um, so it being 74% and 62% nationally, Texas was able to get these surveys in and we continuously do a yearly survey to see if numbers are dropping or growing to start acting. Sorry, I can't agree with the mask. Mm. The inclusion's greatest challenges. Um, it was reported in the NRPA inclusion report that insufficient funding, which is 50% of the, the, the challenges, as well as 46% inadequate staffing, 29% 29 29 on facility space and 25% of lack of training. Um, going into this project, we took into consideration these challenges to see what could be the solution. Um, so starting this project, we did, again, try to cross our T's, dot our I's to see if this program is gonna be implemented, are we gonna have sustainability? Because that was our key. Much of what we were proposing uh, offered the education and information on opportunities for individuals with physical or cognitive disabilities. Much of what this multi-sensory room can possibly bring if, um, if exercised by all um, organizations, our, our health department, as well as um, partners. Uh, we can offer physical activity programs, exercise classes, volunteers and employment activities. 
health and wellness programs. So this multi-sensory room is gonna be, uh, if we again utilize it with um, teamwork, we're able to implement these type of programmings in that area, in, in that multi-sensory room. So uh, we do go into and we do emphasize with our partners, for instance, Parks and Recreation, that the start of this type of project would uh, greatly benefit individuals through a physical employment and health and wellness type of um, topics and areas in their life. A multi-sensory room provides an area of training, education, and recreation opportunities. It's designed to promote intellectual activity, heighten awareness, promote brain arousal, and encourage relaxation. Uh, the rooms are engineered to bring together multi-sensory room equipment to stimulate the sensory pathways of touch, taste, sight, sound, smell, and movement without the need of intellectual reasoning. Again, we, we focus on the benefits of a multi-sensory room. We look at it, it improving focus, developing and reactive, reactivate senses, encourages socialization, improves motor development, improves cognitive development, physical skills, relaxation, language, language development. So there's plenty of benefits. Going into a step-by-step -step of a multi-sensory room, we understood that families were um, gonna be encouraged to utilize these areas, but how? And that goes back into programming. Uh, we look for educational and recreational purposes for these areas. Um, our state program does that by offering information, resources, and then possibly even educating through virtually so that they have a space to still practice in their own areas. Um, uh, workshops in client enrollment. Uh, this could now be an area where I myself can make an on-site visit to register families. Um, also provide workshops there while the child or young adult might need an area for respite care or an area to uh, be able to be stimulated while the parent or the caregiver is getting resources. Um, it's a win-win for the family. Um, the room will be used by our programs and to offer services for the caregivers and families, for example, healthy, uh, healthy living, um, and it offers opportunities in collaboration with other organizations and agencies, for instance, respite care. This is an idea of the, uh, an outline of the multi-sensory room. There's gonna be one room of a, sen uh, it's gonna be the sensory room and the activity room. Um, the sensory room is gonna focus more on cal in a calming environment and the activity room is gonna be focused more on developing and uh, practicing skills. Um, much of what's gonna be on site in the sensory room is gonna be a, a under the sea theme. Uh, so much of what you'll see here is, um, you know, wall bubbles, you'll see a curtain that's, it'll be the same color as blue, um, sea themed activities that focus on motor skills and visuals. Um, so this one sensory room, it's gonna have light um, tactile material, but more visual. Mm. <clears throat> and in our main activity room, we're focused on uh, music. So much of the activities that are wall-based as well as floor-based, they're gonna be interactive music as well as tactile material for them to focus on the walls that lead to like percussion, busy percussion boards, um, being interactive. Um, Again, this is gonna be, the activity room is gonna be connected to another room. Um, they have a separation board that um, allows two rooms to be in that one entire room. Um, so this will be on one side and gives us an opportunity to utilize the opposite side for programs for caregivers. Um, again, this is a, a room that we had an, um, an outlook for for music. It could, of course, change throughout the years where if they want to use it for interaction for music class for individuals or even a learning area for educational purposes. Um, much in that, uh, much uh, of the tactile material and educational material that we're going to be putting in these areas are also books, um, also educational communication boards. Um, we know it might be difficult, financially difficult, for families to be able to afford these types of um, resources. So our goal is to have a library there so that they're able to go on site and visit and utilize it and practice these skills on site at the recreation center. Um, of course, our goal when it comes to respite care, that's a long-term goal. Right now, we're still on short-term goals where we have an area um, for families to visit. Uh, but 
eventually we get to the long-term goals where uh, we do have a respite care area and families are able to exercise in one room or possibly join another recreational activity. Again, our, our focus on this was to make sure that the caregiver has their own hour also because with a healthy caregiver provides healthy caregiving. So that was our main focus also on the sensory room and activity room. Our focus on teamwork when it comes to funding, the state has been very open and um, supportive on training material. So when requesting the funding for this, uh, the training material when, when uh, requested, I had mentioned to them that much of the items that are in this sensory room and activity room are gonna be utilized through educational purposes as well, through uh, virtually and on-site for parents for workshops. Uh, they love the idea, so the funding was approved by the state for this last year to uh, utilize it for the activity room. Um, inadequate staffing, uh, we, we are going to advocate for working with collaboration on these programs. Um, if there's an organization out there that would like to team up with Parks and Rec to have something there um, that their organization can benefit the families, we're supportive of it because I think the more collaborations, the more partnerships, it's going to open more programming for families, uh, especially if they have a specialty in an area, whether it be PT, OT, speech, things of that sort. Facility space and shortages? Yes, there is. <laughs> but we have to think outside the box, thus us collaborating with these departments like Parks and Recreation, and hopefully in the future, maybe the public libraries. Um, so these are areas that are already developed, but we're really just modifying them to be inclusive. So the funding is not as much as it would be from starting from the foundation and up, but more adding funding into an area to help create inclusivity in already a developed area. The lack of staff training. Our program is dedicated and has a continuous pledge to go out and train, if not find a resource to help train individuals to help others that have disabilities. Um, I know uh, some of the voices that we've heard throughout the project is, um, is there training offered? Is it available? And the state comes back saying, yes, we, we can help provide that, or it could be possibly free, or our staff can do it and get trained to help assist them. Um, or uh, collaborating yeah, with other organizations to help on the response to that. Um, much of the challenges that we were facing with this project have slowly but surely been answered through uh, the teamwork that we've had with the, uh, the collaboration with the departments as well as outside organizations. I'm very hopeful for this project. Um, again, every project has challenges and barriers. Mm -hmm. And focusing on our population, which is children and young adults with special health care needs, this multi-sensory room is not just for children and young adults, but it can go also for senior citizens. So the focus on this was, of course, uh, it was great that it was gonna benefit all populations, but it's uh, more benefiting knowing that programs can sustain, be sustainable when there's partners and collaboration. So I'm really happy about this program being developed. Um, hopefully um, this next year, um, once we present it to the state this month, uh, we're offered more opportunities to focus on more areas, and if so, we continue to connect with our partners here at the BRC to see how, mo how more we can grow or what more we can do for programming. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's it. That's <laughs> Is there any questions? Or no, and you know what you answered? I was going to ask what age, but it's true, you know, that you're going to go all the way up to because people need that service no matter what. Now, who's going to man it, or would it be manned by the individual utilizing it at the time? The, the, from um, our meetings and our conversations, um, when it comes to these areas, we know families, uh, whether the caregiver or the individual mm -hmm. with a disability, will be together um, in these areas for monitoring as well as um, it's more so of an educational area for the individual or the families to go and teach certain skills. Mm -hmm. um, for example, there might be things that occupational, uh, we might have, we're going to have uh, items on site that work with occupational therapy with motor skills in the, in the hands. So if the caregiver goes, the young adult or the child can work on it while the caregiver is there mm -hmm. and practicing with them. And that's where our educational videos come in and say, we have this on site, this is how you use it, and this is what the benefits are. Um, because we know that 
Therapy is probably once or twice a week. Um, so if they don't have these resources at home to continue practicing with their child or young adult, they have a site to be able to go to to be, have these resources to continue that practice. Um, so uh, we're going to be collaborating with agencies, organizations to help us with these videos and possibly give us monthly tips on saying, look, this is something that can benefit your motor skills, your anything that goes into occupational PT and speech. Um, as far as the staffing, I know Parks and Rec is limited, especially now with sure. COVID, mm -hmm. uh, but they will be on site uh, again once people check in. But uh, when it comes to programming, uh, depending on the programming, there will be a ratio. For instance, if I'm doing a, a workshop or if I'm doing a class, uh, a recreational activity class that incorporates therapeutic recreation, mm -hmm. I would make sure and have a ratio to make sure I focus on every what family I, yeah. and, and, and make sure that you know, start seeing the demands, okay, we're gonna start making more classes because mm -hmm. we have more families attending. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I see it as the partners and the collaborative organizations going through ratios first and then seeing the need and then continuously growing. To build on that. Mm -hmm. Good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, you've done a lot of work, okay? Yes. <laughs> um, I have a number of questions. Would this program be fully funded by the state? The materials, the training materials, yes. As for right, uh, as for this project, everything has already been covered through uh, state funding from training material. Again, we are we are utilizing this material in multiple ways. One through educational videos, um, being able to have on-site education and workshops with the materials, and then also applying it to. Uh, the community to come in and utilize it on their own time. So the state found it as um, approval to put, uh, to provide us with this uh, funding to uh, to develop the room. So you, you use the word sustainability, <clears throat> which means that you have a way that you need to you need funding mm -hmm. yes. to keep it running mm -hmm. operational. You use the word you have staffing in there also. Okay, so people need to get paid. So. Are the collaborating agencies that are involved now willing to contribute to in literally their staff or a monetary way mm -hmm. to keep it operational? Okay, so that's one thing I know that the state provides a lot of them, but I also understand that you need a location which you may, you may have to pay rent for. Okay, I don't know. Unless, unless we can get it into one of the uh, community centers in there. Okay, I don't know what your plans are right now. But, you know, I, I'm just wondering whether when you use sustainability, for me the first thing that came out is are, are the services that you all are going to be providing reimbursable? Um, and, and of course to be reimbursable, that means that the person that's providing the service needs to have certain credentials. And so, mm -hmm. and so that's a common masking, okay, because Funding-wise, that's the only way to do it. If, we, if you're going to need an ongoing funding source, and unless someone is, unless there are other partners in the group that are willing to contribute, that whatever funding is necessary, the stuff that's necessary. And so, I just wanted to ask you about that. Okay, maybe I can answer that question. Okay. So, um, we do hope that the program that Christine is involved with definitely continues to provide some funding and resources um, to continue the programs. Um, they're very excited about this particular project. So, uh, of course, and we're looking to expand not only in other recreation facilities, but the libraries as well. So, there is a long term plan. Uh, in terms of uh, sustainability. So we did connect with Parks and Rec Department and our vision here is to, uh, yes, there's some specialized skills, but her program can also provide training, which means that the inclusion, the training, the, the transition into offering these services should be seamless. So the person that is manning the rec can have the tools available or the con you know the, be conscientious of the fact that there might be populations that require you know special attention but the training would be provided by the health department so to that to it staff. doesn't look like you know oh 
Sorry, we can't uh, help you. You know, rec member A mm-hmm. came in and you have this, oh, you have to go with this person. No, it has to be seamless. It has to be integrated. Mm-hmm. We have to show inclusion. So that is our vision, um, and we continue to work. Of course, there is challenges, but we do see a lot of momentum. We do see um, support by um, city management as well. So we want to take that on and, and continue. So this is technically our pilot program, and we'll see. Uh, we're going to learn a lot from this, so uh, we're excited to see the outcomes. Sure, and I know it's a lot of work. Okay, um, you you mentioned uh, partnerships and collaboratives, and just so that you know, there, I don't know if you're aware that Border Region does have a sensory room. They've had it for I guess for the ten years or so, and so I don't know if you want to touch base with them to find out just to go see what what they have and how they use their. Their facility. Mr. Chair, if I may, um, the sensory rooms are also available through the school districts, especially United Independent School District uh, has sensory rooms available. And then, as, as I heard her develop um, the module, if, if you will, of uh, communication board, for example, through um, speech therapy, occupational therapy, things of, of this nature. Um, and she mentioned that she wanted to coordinate and get partners throughout the community, um, which any program needs to be successful. Um, the obvious thing is, of course, the special education departments at both districts offer all of these services. And so perhaps uh, one of the considerations for joining with community partners would be the school districts, as well as obviously the agency like where they count the other, the other piece I was thinking about, as she mentioned, um, providing services, of course, for parents. There are in-home services available for parents to have, if you will, respite while um, while working with, for example, uh, children on the spectrum at home. All those things are available also through the school district, and it, it would be wonderful if um, these connections could be uh, made, um, as she mentioned, seamless. The reason is because a lot of these therapy programs and services to parents um, are highly individualized and uh, to meet the needs of each individual um, person or student with a disability or um, constellation of disabilities. Um, so that you know there could be not just partnering and communication throughout uh, the community, but also um, provide that seamless service that she's talking about and and of course the dream is always to be fully inclusive of uh, people with disabilities because we all know that they are very able and capable individuals they only need a chance to prove themselves so um, I highly congratulate you know the development of all these programs that I pray that it comes to fruition and I hope that there will be communication and, and to make these programs truly seamless throughout the community. But really well done. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Hinger, for that information. And I think that's one of the greatest, you know, uh, values of this committee that <coughs> most of the time resources are available. And I think a lot of the members here, we've had this conversation over and over again. We, there are resources and we just need to make those connections and really maximize the reach and the impact we'll have in our community. So just having this ability to sit down and you know have, share ideas, uh, share knowledge uh, is so critical for the success of our program. So I'm sure Christine's going to follow up with the districts, Ruth Vital, Border Region. Uh, to to see you know what's out there and make sure those connections are made so that we all come together to provide these services. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely, and, and we know it's a lot of work, and we know that the services are needed regardless of who already has them in existence, okay? mm-hmm. because the needs are there, and, and you know you all know very well that sometimes. You know, we go back to the resource manual that we have no clue yeah. of the amount of services that are provided in this community until you see it in the, so you see the <laughs> and, uh, 
Right. So it may be across the street from you where you live and you still didn't even know that that service existed. Sure. So the but more of them that exist, the better you know, we would be able to saturate the market and, and people would know what you know what is out there available for them, especially sure. for not only for the, the, the individual themselves that has a need, but the family themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, respite becomes a real big deal because when you have a child or even an adult and these ongoing continuous assistance that person, the caregiver, needs a break now and then, and needs time, and you know, and so the respite portion becomes just as critical as the actual service itself. And so I congratulate you and thank you for, thank you. for doing all the work, okay? Um, I'm sure you'll be very successful. I look forward to giving you updates as well as um, working on long-term goals. Uh, and I want to thank Mr. Rodriguez <laughs> She's the one that planted the seed. <laughs> I was really excited. I, I, and again, it's it's uh, partnerships, collaborative efforts, I, and I know advocacy is not easy. It, it's not even with uh, yesterday's meeting with the partners in policy making. I was um, amazed to hear some of the stories uh, of other advocates and what they've been through, and, um, and this population, especially within uh, you know any disability. Uh, advocacy is just it's 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 a battle yeah but uh, I'm happy that uh, this program has come to the city because uh, it only hits close to home mm -hmm. and then also being able to uh, allow it to grow mm -hmm. uh, it's a beautiful thing yes <laughs> you know we were talking about this just the other day um, there's a place in Houston I have to get to the name because you know and maybe you know there's a place in Houston that has, you go and it's like, I don't know, it's like a play museum or what, but they have a wall. You remember the light bright, the pegs? Oh, yes. mm -hmm. But they have a whole wall. Can you imagine to do that? And the pegs are big so they can build oh, stone. Okay. Um, and then that they've got this thing that blows, let's just say it's co colored construction paper, right? And it starts to blow it out and then you've got to go and you've got to find just all the reds and you've got to find the blues. So they've got some really cool stuff. I'm gonna look it up and I'll email it to you. Maybe the museum? It's, you know, it, they have one in New York and it's new in Houston. And we were just talking about this um, here a couple of days ago. But that may, I mean, I'm sure there's money, right? But maybe we've got some gracious people out there who could. We, uh, our program for this year, I know when, when during COVID, they uh, pushed back on the travel. Yeah. Uh, but this year, I am asked to make three to four different trips. Wait, no, that's where you need to go. <laughs> <laughs> one, of them, one of them is, I, I, I've never been to this area, but it's Be Ready, uh, I, I'm not sure what it is, uh, Be Ready Kids, but it is a, um, it's a multi-sensory uh, amusement area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's one area. The others are children's hospitals. But mm -hmm. uh, we could, uh, the state does like for us to make these trips to get ideas and bring them back home. Sure. Be able. Yes, but that it's Be Ready Kids. I'm just not sure what the location is, but they did already voice it out to us. But I'm excited because, uh, again, this is our, I say this is our first year being able to fully um, fully do what we could do in this program because of COVID, it was restricted us, but we had to find different ways to do outreach. Mm -hmm. But this one's gonna allow us to, I'm very big on on ideas of collaborating with outside resources, yes. hearing their ideas and their struggles and challenges to learn from them. Yeah, to see jump on the train, right? right. Why yes. reinvent the wheel? <laughs> They've done it, let me just jump on your tail, on your coat chain here, let's do it. <laughs> yeah, well, good. Christine, thank you so much because I know that you, every month you enlighten us with yeah. what you're doing. <laughs> so this was a pleasant surprise. Okay. So are we done? Yes. 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 Okay. <laughs> nice. and, and the one who brought it to light didn't speak, so I'm waiting for the speech. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I gave it the middle. I know we sat together and talked about, when Christine came to me, we talked about you know, providing something for the children and the, mm -hmm. the fact that, you know, they do the therapy. But you're right, I think that the family is here and we really need to have different options because mm -hmm. they do come in only three times a week and then what else do they do? Mm -hmm. You know, they want to continue that and having a place like this. We talked about how we are, we are in the process, we have a sensory room ongoing, and uh, it's been through through donations and things like that. And so when we talk, we were just sharing ideas of what we need, and the therapists that we have having all these ideas. So ours is a, um, a pro, uh, 
in the process of hoping growing to be as nice as what you have on there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, I didn't really know that I had planted that seed to tell you the truth, <laughs> other than we sat there and talked about and you said how uh, you were looking into that and getting some friends. So I'm glad that if I gave any information and, and went into this, I'm glad. <laughs> you made it better. Absolutely. So thank you. Thank you so much. We do that with our children there. Recently we did have, like I said, that the summer camp, especially with children, we did have, and I did reach out to you, and it was amazing. Respite is very important for the parents. You don't know how grateful they are to be able to come and, and leave them with people that know can exactly care, for them. care for them. Because these are involved, very involved patients where they do feeding, diaper changes, being, making sure that if they do eat, they're being, they swallow. So we have the staff available, and now through that grant, we were able to get some people in. Uh, but it's not just a summer camp. Summer camp that you just kind of put the children in there. There's planning to be done. Yeah. Although they only gave us two weeks this time to prepare. Wow. <laughs> we never say no to be able to provide those for parents because since we've been providing that summer camp, parents, you know, are excited to be able to do that. We would want to do it more often. So through South Texas Development Council, Mr. Juan Rodriguez, he's amazing, and um, mm -hmm. that we're going to meet again this week to talk about another summer camp, but. Thank you. It's, it's wonderful. Well, if there's anything we can do to help or thank you, support thank you. America, definitely. It. Yes. We, if you need our help, then yeah, you know we're there. We know we're there. It's there. And I should say that we've been very busy getting more children because we have a beautiful. You've seen it. Um, yes. Kids zone. Mm -hmm. And I invite you whenever the time to go and see it. And where it's That's the one I went to the play. <laughs> we have a dry plumbing wall. We have an inside. It's 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 really nice. It's really and our theme is outer space. So um, the the lights in there and everything. It's, it's just beautiful. Fine, let you go see it. I mean, I don't think you see no, it. Yeah, it's 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 a nice large room. Check it out. And you're right. A lot of people don't know that these resources are there and that we have this. Youth Peak Hall has been there for 60 years, and I still don't hear people say, oh, really, you do that? <laughs> <laughs> Jeanette can relate, right, Miss Jeanette? Uh -huh. years. Last year. You <laughs> 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 born say, but why doesn't a lot of people know about it? I said, because, you know, we're right before the, uh, the pandemic, we were in a, a five, like four year moment when reintroducing the center, people have the notion mm -hmm. that we're only for people that cannot pay. But more and more, we're getting uh, a lot of uh, people that go there because of the outcome of their kind of care and the success they're having through the therapy. Yeah. In fact, you know, I was at um, with Dr. Nogueira yesterday because, of course, my job is asking for money. And I know that's who I COVID from they see me at COVID relief fund because we need it. We're seeing a lot of recovered COVID patients, yeah. right? And so, and then he said, okay, Jackie, you, because I send letters out, we need money, but I mean the devil's advocate. How, how can you get COVID relief money? What, what is your part in this? And then, and then I had, all I said was, I couldn't believe that they don't realize that therapy is vital for these yes, patients. Yes. Because their, yeah, their lives have been saved, you know, they've been intubated. They, they, they had there, stroke, but they stroke, and they're, they're, they're sitting in a wheelchair without the ability, and they're so weak. And I just, I pulled out a, a picture, I bought a picture, right, of the patient that was intubated because it's, he's our human interest story with an anyway, and how he would get to the center in an ambulance because he was so involved, and then as he was gradually progressing, and then he, his eyes just went like that and go, I get it. You need money. I said, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, the people don't realize, and for, them to, for there to be more of these places is just going to spread the word and hopefully people can get to those places. I'm just very really happy and proud of you all working on this. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, what you mentioned is important to know that people don't understand that the COVID pandemic affects you not only in that moment when you're hospitalized, mm -hmm but it continues affecting your health for years to come. Mm -hmm. And so and so people don't realize that that's, that's not, that's... It's not just like a band there's, there's several mm -hmm. stages to this, to this illness. Exactly. Right? And so mm -hmm. you may never get rid of some of the effects that it prints upon you. Some of these patients were only able to get them back. That came in that was a human interest story. He was a normal person, you know, got COVID. And once he got off the, being intubated, he was so weak 
we have to, they have to work with, you know, muscles, yeah. physical yeah. occupation, even speech, because even his yeah. muscles, you need well, to because of the like intubation. Mm -hmm. You know, and so one of the things and uh, was that he was able to go to the bathroom by himself, but he was so weak that he couldn't move. Mm -hmm. So he had to be in pampers downstairs in his house in the bed. His wife would have to, I know it sounds, but it's not, you know, he, it's reality. the dignity, yeah. you know, he felt like so much we, when we got up to where he could be able to sit up and slide into at uh -huh. least one of those portable toilets, he couldn't be so much appreciated. I mean, we see this every day. Yeah. It's all emotional, and we're just so appreciative of our abilities, mm -hmm. you know, being able yes. to move her. And we take so many things for granted, yes. Jackie. Exactly. You know, thank you for that because mm -hmm. it's true. We have to, I, I'm glad and blessed to be there because I see it every day. And whenever I get over and I go, oh, I have to, yeah. I have to wash my hair. <laughs> 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 At least I can wash it and be yeah. able to do that. So with, with this, that's just one of the examples of people not realizing that once your, your life is saved, okay, that's not it. There's another process. Yes. Yeah. And even the CDC brought up an article before they said that physical occupation of speech therapy is going to be vital for these patients. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes, no, I just wanted to add to that, um, that VR sent out an email recently that there is, um, they're calling it long COVID. Mm -hmm. That's what they're calling it. And they're saying that that is now being considered a disability for our services. Mm -hmm. There's no formal medical diagnosis, but they're just calling it long COVID. Mm -hmm. And what it is, is it could be an individual that already had a disability and got COVID and it exacerbated mm -hmm. their, their um, symptoms or it could be someone that didn't have a disability ever at all mm -hmm. and just got COVID, mm -hmm. but has residual symptoms oh. from COVID mm -hmm. that have been long-term, that didn't go away after the COVID yeah. uh, was no longer diagnosable. So if you guys know, like those mm -hmm. individuals, you if they're looking for employment or lost their mm -hmm. job because of yeah. missing work, um, their individuals we could possibly help mm -hmm. just because of the impact, the long-term impact of COVID. They don't need to have any other disability. Yeah. So that's, that's new. Good. That's yeah. Oh, thank you for that's sharing to know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We get to this part in our history of and this avoid getting COVID. I guess we were very fortunate and lucky. And um, I guess it's just, yeah, for me it's just very unfortunate that we still have such a large number of individuals who refuse to be vaccinated and I just don't understand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's an entire different argument. Okay, so we're done with that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let me go on to letter B. Um, do you want an update on services for individuals with disabilities and any other new or additional services as a result of or in response to COVID-19 pandemic? I think we ironed that one out. Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We go to letter C. Discuss City Ordinance number 2018-0-050. The re-implementation of the face-to-face -face committee meetings. Um, and I guess I brought this back up because this has been just, it was discussed last time. However, mm. I don't know if we fully got confirmation and I think we may have Erica regarding if attending my phone is, is just give you full credit. So previous to COVID, it did. So, previous to COVID, right? it did, okay. O through the Open Records, Open Meetings Act. Okay. Um, we did send out an email, I sent out an email to city secretary and have not received a response. So, um, I mean, unless I'm told otherwise, I'll share with, with the committee. But at this time, I know last month that we were meeting, you know, numbers looked a little bleak. They were rising. We were concerned. Uh, we're seeing a downtrend just now, you know, so... Um, of course, we're encouraging vaccination. Um, we're happy to report that in our community, we do see a buy-in for vaccination. We were actually, there's been, you know, 
several cycles where we're leading in the state in terms of our rates. So, um, of course, you know, there's always room for improvement, but uh, it does look like our community is receptive of, um, of, you know, obtaining the vaccine and wanting to be protected. Masks as well, you know, with this whole, um, at the state level, whether or not they can be mandated and things like that, we do see um, just community members taking a personal, you know, responsibility to take those extra precautionary measures. So, um, but going back to guidance in terms of the meetings, um, like I said, we did shoot out to the city secretary. Uh, I'll go ahead and um, remind them that we need some additional information on that. Uh, but I, I do recall, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it's been a long time. So, <laughs> but uh, through Open Meetings Act, I believe a phone um, phone dialing was. What I recall about the open meetings and regarding phones is if if, um, if you had a quorum already, mm -hmm. okay, and somebody was on the phone, that was fine, okay. And I guess, and I guess because of COVID, probably the uh, calling in by phone has become even more acceptable, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. But the other follow up to that is: is there a limit to how many phone calls? Can you can you call in for how many meetings can you call in for? Is it fair for somebody who to call in every meeting and be out the whole year okay. if, they, if they if they wanted to or had to? Is it fair to the rest of the group that's here? I don't know. Right, and there's no clarification in the ordinance with the absences. So again, we'll reach out to city secretary to get. Um, and even our, our legal, um, sometimes I get um, more of a response through our legal department or city attorney, so I'll reach out to her as well to see uh, if there's any guidance on that. Yeah, because as, as a chair, I can tell you my concern is that everybody calls and says one day, oh, we're going to call in, and I'm right. the only one here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is that a formal? <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, is that, is, well, how would that work? And so, yeah, we probably need some kind of guidance on not only is it okay, we're okay with it, but is there a limit? Is there a cap? Right. Okay. You know, yeah, I'll, I'll reach out to them again. Mm -hmm. And any information, I'll make sure to provide before our next meeting. And, and of course, everything depends on circumstances, right? If a person's ill or et cetera, and can make it, that's perfectly fine, but we probably need some guidance there as well. Okay, I'll reach out to them again. Um, item two is the termination of members with four absences. Okay, I'm gonna be totally honest with you. I have three members who have four absences or more. Okay, and that started since January. Remember the calendar started since January till the present. Okay, so I've got four members and I have, after meeting, meeting with Erica last time, okay, she brought me back into the room and she told me, you do have members that have been out for four times, have four times. And the ordinance says four and you're out. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm in a position right now where I have to, I guess I don't have to make the, the, the decision's been made for us, okay, through the ordinance. My argument is if I probably need to speak to some of these individuals if they want to continue if they sincerely want to continue in the committee, then I need a commitment, and then I can argue that point with the council, but which I don't know if it's going to do any good, right? I don't think I can overturn their decision. <laughs> so I've but, done some some preliminary footwork in that, in, in trying to get some ground, and um, as I explained last month, you know, a city secretary was very adamant that ordinance is law, so. Um, it would be a challenging <laughs> um, feat to to approach them and ask for any special considerations. Of course, you know it's a case by case basis, so um, anything can happen. I mean, council can can provide their own guidance. This is a mayor appointed committee, so we could always ask you know for guidance for from the mayor's office to see how they would want to to approach that. So. 
I know that Mr. Delgado had already expressed being unable to continue. We were expecting something in writing from him. However, since he's already shown excessive absences, I would just um, recommend to the committee. Uh, I also checked with city secretary to see if there was any formal in writing that would be provided by city secretary's office and there's not since it's automatic. We just um, revert back or, or refer back to the ordinance. Um, the committee can decide if you want to draft a letter as a courtesy to the member and explain that as per that, you know, they, they're no longer a city member of the committee, but that's completely up to you. Um, something we can help you draft. Just uh, let us know if you want to proceed with that. If not, I mean, we can remove them from the roster as per ordinance and request, you know, recommendations for, for replacement. So if, if I follow the ordinance to the letter, okay, that means that I'm losing not only Mr. Delgado, but four other individuals, okay? Um, that's a pretty significant loss, okay? Um, so I probably need to reach out. I would like at least to reach out to these four, three individuals, okay, at least the ones that I know, ask them if they're committed or not. I can, we can submit something to the council, like an appeal, okay. Um, do you remember, Erica, when, when they, when they republished or recommitted to this ordinance? It wasn't in January, or was it? No, I want to say it was March or May. Paula, do you remember when we met at City Hall? It was about May. May, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. See, my, my... That gave us a... My, my, gave my us problem reminder. with that... <laughs> my problem with that is that um, they're, they're retro initiating it back, okay? Well, the thing is, the ordinance wasn't in since Well, I understand that, but because of COVID, okay, I don't know if there was a lack of flexibility. My only discuss, my only issue with that is that they didn't. It was re reissued or reinforced, okay, re reinforced, okay, um, in May or March or May, okay, and so we had already had three or four months of people that were totally not aware of how 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 to what degree it could affect their membership here. And so that would that would be my only request that they reconsider that. Okay. Okay. Them implementing it to the to the full capacity. That's my only concern with that. Um, I I understand that the ordinance has been around since several years back. But we were that was a very trying time. Those were very difficult moments. You know, last few months, okay, people were here, not here. Um, and so the only thing that I would ask the city council to consider is that they didn't re-implement it or re back reinforce it and make it a big deal until March or May, okay? And, and by that time, three, three to five months had already passed from the calendar year. Mm -hmm. And so some of you may have not have been aware that your membership was in jeopardy. Okay, maybe things would have been different. I don't know. That's my only, just my, not, my, not my argument, but I would like them to reconsider or consider that fact. Yes. Of course, I first have to go to those three members that are still here and ask them, if you're going to commit, fine, but you know, you can't miss anymore. Like, I know I have people with four absences right now, they're aware of it, they've been aware for the last month or two, they're not here again. Mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with those, okay? But I do see somebody that's here today who's got four absences, mm -hmm. okay? And so, and, you know, they're, they're, I think they're vital, crucial to the community and to your presence here. And so, I would like you to continue and I'm not discounting the validity or value of everyone else, but um, you know, you've all been aware that for the last several months that we are, uh, this ordinance is in place, and it's enforceable, it's being enforced and actionable, and so 
that's my only interest. That's what I would like to do. Okay. Give it all. Um, I'll definitely share the feedback with management. And again, any guidance I have received. Um, I've been with this committee from the get go. Um, I, I see the the value, and I understand, you know, COVID, and just, you know. A lot of the all the members here are professionals. You take time from your busy schedules to attend and make that additional impact in your community. So, I mean, you're speaking to you're preaching to the choir here <laughs> because I've made every every uh, you know I'll make every effort to ensure <coughs> that every consideration is placed. And I know that. Um, Thank you for looking into. I know that mine was updated because mm -hmm. I think that I had two extra absences where I know and that I was here and I sent in that information. You weren't able yes. to update that. So, right. so you're off the hot seat. Um, <laughs> 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 so I'm going to be shocked. So I advocated for you for nothing. <laughs> So then the other two individuals are right here. Is, is their roster correct? Yes. Okay. So there's two, not three, just for the minute. I just, I did see the eye contact at the end and I was like, <laughs> Okay. So that's what we'll do with the other two remaining that we know for sure have four absences. I'll reach out to them, speak to them. Um, but again, I don't, I don't know the validity, how how well that would go because they're very much aware of what the. With this, with the circumstances hold right now, it's and, and that's why I recommend, Mr. Chair, if you want us to draft a, a just a generic letter in the BRC letterhead, you guys have your letterhead, and just citing the ordinance and saying, you know, you have missed this, you know, this consecutive meeting from such date to such date. Ask for ordinance this. Thank you for your contributions. Sincerely. Um, and we well, I think that we need to do that with at least the two individuals that I have left. Okay, we'll work on okay. that. Okay, because mm -hmm. I would, I would be, um, I would raise concerns if they were not aware, but they've been here for one or two meetings, mm -hmm. and um, again, they're not, again, they're not here today, and they haven't called in, so I. What am I doing? I, mean, I, I, I can't do very much on their behalf. So then the, the follow-up the follow up to that is, okay, so we have terminations of those two, three. We have three people who are being terminated or terminated or chose to leave or et cetera. Then we have to, uh, we have the option of recommending to, to the mayor so I'm not asking for names now, but if you have an idea of who do you who might who might be interested in, yes, no. Oh, I just had a question. So, like, are they able to come back under like just community member under like public comments? Sure, anyone can come in and just back, sit down. If they were a member and lost so, their membership, yeah, in the roster we can put them as guests. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
I was just thinking maybe that could be on the letter so they don't feel like they could never go back. Oh, yes, definitely. They just can't like vote, right? Right. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to understand. Um, mm -hmm. well, I didn't have a, 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 a member. <laughs> or an organization that <laughs> would <laughs> Was we know what these individuals were or are, we know what organization they come from. Maybe we can so make somebody get a from replacement there. from that organization. Okay, I think so. Yeah. So you still have that representation, right? Yeah. Mm. Right. Mr. Chair, um, my concern is: um, should there be a place that is open? I would hope that there would be representation from both school districts, and as far as they are, um, they do provide services for people with disabilities. Neither, neither or one of the school districts are of a concern regarding this ordinance right now. And Dr. Rickman, did you hear me? Yes, I did. Yeah. I'm not also thinking about the university. I'm thinking back to a professor over there who had started a, um, a satellite for providing evaluations with neuroscience um, background for for students who were on the spectrum. I was just while you were saying that, that that's not an issue, I was also thinking in terms of if there is a place for someone, a specialist perhaps, um, food services or um, who is developing professionals with knowledge in servicing uh, people on the spectrum or just, you know, people with disabilities. That would be, I think, an asset to the committee as well. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, whether there, whether it's an individual or an organization they represent, that would be fine. We just, um, if you all want to take the next several weeks to think about that, and then you bring back those names or organizations that you think we could reconsider, or rather we could recommend to the mayor, um, that would be a good so that they can contribute their knowledge, their skills, their experiences, and that would be good. Okay, letter D is discussed recommend possible new replacement, so we just done that. Mm -hmm. And um, the other thing was that I know that we had asked, um, we had spoken for the last several weeks about community resource manual that for us to put one together, and it's uh, apparently 211 already has one. Mm -hmm. And so I guess my question was, I would, since it's not our work, it's not our publication, okay? I don't know that we could, if they have it in, in a electronic format that we could put it onto our website. Well, if it's now online, we can definitely um, put in a link on your website to refer to their mm -hmm. information. But do they have it on their website? That's what I understood. I, I didn't look. That's what I understood from last meeting. The 211? That there's a link, there's a link to it. Yes. And um, it's very it's it's very up to date. Um, if uh, a parent were to come to me and tell me I need um, a specific therapy or a specific therapist, you can therapist. type it in and it'll show you your location or the nearest location or throughout Texas. So, okay, it's, so, it's very... so we could benefit from that as okay. well. Do we just put it onto our website? Yes. Okay. I didn't know we needed to ask permission from them to do it. It's a general state resource, so I don't think it should be an issue. <clears throat> okay, that was the last of the items of the action items. Um, agenda item number five is announcements. Anyone getting married, having a baby? Oh, yeah, that's me. <laughs> I do want to open no, We're having an orthopedic clinic, it's tomorrow, and I send out a flyer. It's the free orthopedic clinic for children, of course, our UT Health Science um, Center doctors come down. And we have a few spaces available, so if you, have, if you know of anyone, but it is tomorrow, uh, you can call today and even in the morning, we can 
squeeze them in. We like to be able to cover, make sure we have all the spaces filled. Uh, and so we can all make one. We're also going to be having a job article clinic. Uh, of course, it's free. It's only a $5 processing fee. But we'll send out, I'll send you all uh, the flyer as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to just make an announcement real quick. So since our last meeting, right, um, I'm no longer with vocational rehabilitation. Right, I'm in, <laughs> I'm in the new role, but we're still partners and we'll always be. Um, so in my new role, I'm with Laredo Specialty Hospital, so I do the business development, right? So marketing, and I wanted to share, I know we're gonna, we're gonna be talking to you. <laughs> so I did wanna share, you know, we're stroke certified, right? Um, I did speak to the state, Jeanette, just so you know, um, they started a new program for where they've got all the disciplines for stroke and they're looking for those hospitals. So we're in communication with the state to see what we can do there. Where, you know, you've got the OT, the PT, the speech pathology, whatever it is that you're needing to rehabilitate you, right? People think, oh no, Diana, you're gonna to go to the hospital where people die, it's a hospice. There's not a hospice. And if I'm there, you know, the heart's beating, dearie. Mm -hmm. So um, that's the whole purpose, right? Is to let community know that we're here to serve, we do have the LTAC, which is a radio specialty, and then the radio rehabilitation. Um, they do have the largest gym, right, in Laredo for the outpatient. Mm -hmm. They did a soft opening in June, and we're looking to do a hard opening um, down the road, right? So we're excited, um, lots of stuff to cover, but know that we're here as a partner, right? Uh, we're that partner, I'm on the other side, now I'm no longer with the uh, public sector, now I'm with the private sector, right? But still a partner and however it is that we can partner and collaborate then you've got my number paula has got my new email so this is uh, <laughs> and um, and just let us know how we can work together and i didn't want to make that announcement it, it's a uh, fast pace which is what i'm used to right so it's like run, 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 and, and I'm enjoying it so far. But it's a honeymoon phase. We'll get in the meeting. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right, I'll the honeymoon phase. We'll talk next month. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> How long were you, what were you with? Uh, with VR? Uh -huh. uh, two years. And it was an amazing experience. My thought, you know, it's like they say, you make plans and God giggles, right? Because I said, I'm going to plant my flag here. I'm going to retire from VR. Because that's it. And then things come up, so. Yeah. Well, I still have some gas in the tank. I said, I better take it. <laughs> <laughs> so I have an announcement. I have a vacancy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I support assistance. So if you know anyone who wants to apply, let me know. Yeah. And we have a vacancy for case manager. If you know of anyone, uh, intake information does assessments for patients that come in without any pain source. So we're going to be putting out the app, medical office assistant as well, and administrative assistant. So we're getting out there. So I'll send you all the ads if you know of anyone. Yes, Plus, uh, some some good recommendations, absolutely. So we have about 15. <laughs> 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 so if you know of anyone. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to recruit right now. I mean, it's a challenging field, but um, more so, I think now more than ever, we're getting candidates that um, that really believe in the mission, right? So uh, we're we're still, and a lot of things are coming up in terms of workforce, especially public health workforce, and really evaluating compensation and structure and responsibilities and schooling, education, experience, all of that. So mm -hmm. it's an interesting time to, to be in the spot, but we're learning a lot and we want to move forward. We have a lot of goals for the health department um, and definitely the core of our mission is to serve. So mm -hmm. um, that's what we do every day. Yes. Great. You mentioned you had a plastic surgeon. She's <laughs> orthopedic surgeon. An orthopedic uh, clinic. clinic. Ortho. Oh, okay. Ortho clinic. Orthopedic and the ortho. Yeah. We have some orthopedic surgeons with Dr. Fuego. And I've heard really good things of Dr. Potty. He's excellent. Okay, thank yes, you. Yes, these are, these are specialists for the children. Um, and the adult is free, so that that's the difference. They can come and 
consult and they don't have to pay um, and they don't need a referral. So that's awesome. Yeah. And you do that with the collaboration with Utila Science. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's great to partner with them. We are partnering great with them partner. for uh, an Alzheimer's project. So yeah. we do have doctors coming in for that service. And uh, Paola reminded me, thank you, Paola. Uh, we are having a free flu vaccine uh, for individuals. Mm -hmm. Council did approve during the last meeting. Uh, mm -hmm. We're trying to prevent any type of comorbidity between mm -hmm. COVID and flu. Um, so if anyone's interested in getting their flu shot, they can join us downstairs. <laughs> you want to be issuing that out now? Mm -hmm. We got it two weeks ago. We got mm -hmm. our, yeah, our doses mm -hmm. two weeks ago. So we're yes. going to go straight down there. Yeah. Well, 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 it's for two times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're talking about that. The, the booster for Moderna, is that up? Yeah. Oh, so, but you gotta wait eight months, right? From yes. your from your mm -hmm. dosage. But a lot of people so, might be due since they got it. Yeah. So is it available right now or is there a certain population? You can get it now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh they're targeting uh, in you know, compromised mm -hmm. individuals first. They take priority, but if you reach the eight month mark, they don't mm -hmm. oh, good to know. Yes. All right. Well. So is both the Moderna and the Pfizer out, or just Pfizer? What are you doing? The booster. It's the, it's the same. So you, if you took the Moderna, you can still take the Pfizer? Yeah. Oh, I think you have to do the same. You need to stick to the same dose, mm -hmm. to the same medication. Mm -hmm. or, uh, vaccine, yes. Okay. The, okay. Same the same brand. The same brand. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then. Mr. Chair, I have uh, an announcement as well. Yes, ma'am. Um, I think most of you are familiar with Women's Study Club. It's a small group of women uh, from Laredo who work to raise approximately 200000 I think, is for the past few years we've been able to raise $200,000 for charities, for nonprofits, for programs here in town to help. Um, we have a very different fundraiser coming up that I wanted to share with you. It's going to be Saturday, October the 2nd at the Monte Carlo. And I think most of you are familiar with a TV show called The Voice. We are doing The Voice of Laredo. So I need singers. If any of you all know anyone who is a good singer and who might like to perform, uh, the way that we engineered it is Whoever wins first prize as the best singer that night will get $1,500 donated to their favorite local charity. Whoever gets second place will get $1,000 donated to their favorite second, um, their favorite uh, local charity. And third place is 750 In the past, uh, people have donated to the orphanage, the food bank, um, the animal clinic, places like that. Um, so if you know of any singers that might be interested in participating, I'd really appreciate it if you send them my way. Uh, thank you. So how many singers do you have lined up already? We don't have many. That's why I decided to ask you guys. <laughs> okay. Diana, you sing? Oh, oh, oh. I do many things, but I don't sing. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. This is what you can't scare somebody. No, no, no. <laughs> but you all don't want to say that time, but maybe you know someone. Yeah. Ceci, hey, you know. Ceci, are you on the call? No. She's not. No. I thought she was. She was. Yeah, she was. Yes, I am on the call. Oh, yes, hey, Ceci, what is the name of that gal that sings so pretty that we would hire for the, for the national anthem? Oh. Patricia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, give give Dr. Ruth a list of singers. She sings amazing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we, we, we appreciate it. Uh, their names and any kind of contact information, like a, a phone number or an email, yeah, anything like that. Amazing. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Neither one. It's October 2nd. It'll be at the Monte Carlo. And as I say, it's a fundraiser. It's going to be fun. Well, and all the money like, stays here in like, town like, because that's, that's what we're about. We raise money for the radio, for mm -hmm. people who need it in the radio. 
Yes, like thanks to the Women's City Club, it's the kids zone is really they really have been adding to it every year. It's an ongoing project, so thank you. It does a lot. It helps a lot. Well, thank you. It's a, it's a blessing to be able to help. I've been on the board forever, so <laughs> I don't even remember when I joined. It must have been twenty nine or thirty. So, well, oh, 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 oh. so like three years. <laughs> Five years. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. What, what is the what is the donation or the cost? going to be? I'm sorry, yes. What is the donation or the cost going to be? To okay, we have two models of cost. The VIP table of A and the, the good thing about the VIP tables is you get to choose where you want to be, you know, in relation to the performers. The, the table of A is $1,000 that includes a bottle of, of your choice. Uh, reserve table of A is 800 and then the open seating is $75. Okay, good. Cash points at six thirty PM, dinner at seven o'clock, and the show starts at eight. That's good. That's good. Are, the, are you getting the chairs? Ah, <laughs> I love the voice. Oh, they give the chairs. No, 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 We'll probably get volunteers to turn the chair down. <laughs> <laughs> With a rope wrap. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you know, it's a bit too much for us to spend all the money on, you know, whoever needs it here, Lori. Sure. Uh, the, the judges will have their backs to the performers. So that's if we can choose. It's the first time we're doing the boys. Um, I had the idea of doing dancing with the stars, and for years that was real but the ladies want the ladies wanted to try something different this year, so we're going with the boys. Yeah, I think yeah, that's, that's amazing. amazing. Yeah, you did. So, so Dr. Ruth Inger, do the universities produce any talent in that sense? Do they have? Do, uh, yes, uh, there used to be a stronger music program. For example, what, uh, at Laredo College, yeah. we used to have an orchestra program. And that's kind of died down. Uh, one of the air areas I'm tapping is the people I know in the theater community. Right. I've been asking, for example, Michael Gonzalez, I don't know if y'all know him, but he was in the Glee Club for Notre Dame. He has a fabulous tenor voice. Wow. So I'm tapping the yeah, people I know that. in the theater uh, to see if, if they know of anyone. And uh, I'm going to get online, so I was looking to see if maybe um, I could tap some kind of agency that produces, you know, fine arts people. Yeah. Of course, the, the Vidal Magnet School is another area for us that we're tapping and and the person who sings needs to be 15 years old uh or older oh, okay. 15 years old or older okay okay thank you so much for your interest thank i you. hope that it's a success because like i said every penny stays in the right now well thank you for the work that you do and the ladies as well i know that year after year you guys do a lot of work mm -hmm. You know, and um, and unlike unlike other volunteer groups, I know that the Women's City Club, if they collect two hundred thousand, they give away two hundred thousand. They don't. They they start every. No, 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 no. If we have to send out any kind of uh, communication, we have to pay for the staff. Nothing comes out of the little fund, the, our little kitty fund, that is our bank bank account right. for the community. We cannot tap it for. I mean, even a piece of paper that comes out of our own pocket. So yeah, but that's the way it should be, I think. Yeah, I think you do an excellent job. With this. I know that, and again, from personal experience it's and business experience, I know that there are a lot of volunteer groups out there that um, they collect, but they don't, they, they don't donate everything. And I know that the Women's City Club does donate every dime that they collect. And so, you know, you guys do an excellent job of doing that. And, Pennies for pennies is also uh, going on right now. So if you see a little jar anywhere and you want to donate, please do. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Ruth Inger, thank you. Any other announcements? I just wanted to clarify, um, Erica, you have reported that the booster is available for anyone with a pre existing condition or if they've hit the eight month mark on their vaccine is there a verification the card on e either of those what do you mean 
like a pre-existing condition? Do they have to present something? No. Okay. They're just going to bring their cards and take your word for it. Mm -hmm. Yes. I have a question in that regard real quick. Um, is, is the City of Laredo Health Department looking at doing testing for antibodies to see what level of antibody the person has to ascertain whether or not they actually do need the third booster? Um, we do have the capability in our laboratory. However, CDC is not recommending that type of testing at this point um, to decipher whether or not a booster or an additional dose is needed. So as per guidance with CDC, that's, we're not using that test at the time. All right, thank you. Yes. Dr. Rizinger, just for your information, I don't know how accurate or precise this is, but I know that through the media, I have understood that most, by the time you reach your eighth month, you've lost 50% of your coverage, of your protection. I don't know if the numbers are still that high, but that was some of the latest findings, and that's how come they had recommended that people be receive their booster within eight months of the last one. I but it had to do with the fact that you lose, you're only protected about 50% or 60% or less, by the time you reach your eighth month. Mm -hmm. And so that's, so this is in regards to, this is just prompting me because of the question you're asking about the antibodies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, the rate, that's the recommendation based on their studies. And it's still by appointment for vaccine? Uh-huh. You no. just can walk. But the only one you have right now is the Pfizer. No, we have Moderna. Moderna. <laughs> but not the booster. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, the same, it's the same dosage, it's just they're asking you for the third one, right? Mm -hmm. Vaccine initially the first and the second shot, then we can take them. We can take either one. No, no. Seria moderna. You need to stick to the same. Whatever type you got at the beginning, with the same with the same brand. Yes. So does the so does the city right now have Pfizer and Moderna? Yes. So the Moderna was finally approved. Yes. Because it wasn't approved several weeks ago. It was still pending. No, sí, sí la tiene. Okay. Okay, the booster is approved. I believe you're talking about FDA. If they have emergency designation, then yeah. Pfizer got fully yeah. approved and Moderna still. Yeah, but they were still holding back on even the emergency release. So, so. they, uh, okay, that's good to know. Oh. I mean, my mom got in and she said. So everybody's going downstairs to get their flu yeah. shot and their Moderna shot. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna come out with a third time by the time we're done. What happened? I just went to the booster. Can you get it outside? I don't know. Time or like, did you have to wait? No, they they do oh, let you have, have it because I asked oh, really? for my mom. Yes. Uh -huh. So then the, you can have it done at the same time, but then you won't know what gave you if you have side effects. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So it's like recommended to. And Maybe wait a, week, wait a week and then do the other one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Sounds good. I had to get okay. informed for my mom. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if there are no other announcements, then I um, request that we can adjourn. If someone can motion to adjourn. I motion to adjourn. I say. Okay, nine seconds said thank you. Thank Meetings you over. Thank you all. Thank you all. For the ones on the phone, thank you. Thank you. Okay, take care. Thank you. Take care. Bye. -bye. Thank you.